All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Um, just a few announcements uh, as we begin. Uh, I have uh, uploaded a problem set, problem set five, based on chapters 12 and 14. That is up on uh, Blackboard, so you're free to go on there and start looking at that. We're pretty much going to finish chapter 12 today uh, and start 14 on Friday. That said, I'm in my just-in-time delivery mode, which means I haven't finished the course notes for chapter 14 yet, so those will be coming out sometime later tonight or tomorrow uh, in preparation for Friday, Friday's class. So just to let you know about that. Uh, in terms of the project that you need to work on, you have a problem set quiz that's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week, anytime in that window. And you have, of course, your presentation outline, which is due tomorrow sometime to your teaching assistant, not to me, unless, of course, you're working with me. Uh, you're assigned to me, the students who are not in Chem 121. You'll note when you look at the problem set that at least for chapter 12, there's a lot more conceptual questions. There isn't a lot of math in what we're doing in chapter 12. It's kind of a break from math uh, in, in, in this Chem 101 course. So uh, that's that aspect of it. But once we get into chapter 14, there's definitely a, a more an increased mathematical components. So good deal. So just looking at the questions in the chat, the problem set is, no, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is the problem set. So, and for your project presentation outline, anytime tomorrow. So basically up until midnight tomorrow uh, to your TA and uh, they will get back to you. They're going to be the ones that are going to review it and provide you with individualized feedback. So, good. Any other questions on that? problem set is not due at any time it's the quiz that has to run Thursday Friday Saturday so you have a quiz on problem set four and some of that material on problem set four you've already studied for because it was on your term exam but the window for the problems we only the term exam was only on the first half of the problem set not the second half and so you should be able to do quite well on this problem set quiz does that answer your question Jane And so that answers your question then, correct? Good. All right. So this is where we left off last day. We were looking at intermolecular interactions, and I'm just going to back up a few slides. So in terms of single component interactions, it was induced dipole, induced dipole, dipole dipole of which hydrogen bonding is one aspect and ionic interactions and we went through induced dipole induced dipole and we looked at the boiling point as a measure of the strength of these interactions because when you boil something you break all of the intermolecular interactions and so uh, we see uh, in these examples uh, the polarizability increases with atomic mass and it also increases with bonding electrons versus non-bonding electrons. We looked at dipole-dipole interactions and we saw that, okay, neon, of course, as an example, has all non-bonding electrons. Methane has eight bonding electrons, but it's the same mass as neon. And there's a significant increase in boiling point because the polarizability of those bonding electrons is higher. And then we went to HF, same number of electrons, same mass approximately, and uh, a significant increase in boiling point because we now have a dipole associated with HF that we don't have in any of the other two. Uh, on the right-hand side, we had nitrogen and oxygen, both nonpolar. We get a really small dipole in NO, but the boiling point goes up an appreciable amount. Uh, and then we go to a much larger dipole with the same number of electrons and mass, and you see uh, in H2CO a significantly higher boiling point. 
in general, <coughs> induced dipole are weaker than dipole interactions, but that's not always the case because in some things like bromine and iodine, you see significantly higher boiling points. Those atoms are very large, the outer electrons are very polarizable, and so they would be exceptions to the generalized rule of 0.1 to 10, which is kind of your organic realm entities, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, maybe sulfur and chlorine as well, but getting heavier, you see larger polarizabilities. And then we looked at hydrogen bonding uh, here, and it's probably best illustrated by this figure uh, here, in which case the progression in period from carbon to silicon to germanium to tin doesn't show an, a deviation but for period two, but the nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen versions of it show significant deviations, and that's due to hydrogen bonding, with water being the best at hydrogen bonding because it has the same number of donors as it has acceptors. And this is where we ended off last day. We were looking at a hydrogen bonding in ice, and this illustrates that a single water molecule with two hydrogen atoms, those two hydrogen atoms are hydrogen bonded to adjoining oxygen atoms on water, and the two lone pairs on the oxygen are hydrogen bonding to hydrogens on other adjoining water molecules. So we looked at it in the context of simple entities. It doesn't need to be simple. Anywhere where there's a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine will engage in hydrogen bonding within that system. And proteins, DNA, are biological examples of hydrogen bonding. And in this case, that hydrogen bonds hold the proteins together, the three-dimensional tertiary structure. They hold the DNA together but they're weak enough that they can be split. DNA needs to separate for transcription, uh, and proteins need to adjust their shape as they engage in their biological function. For example, the bonding of oxygen to hemoglobin causes a slight but a measurable distortion of the heme ring as the oxygen binds. Interesting about hydrogen bonding is that when you compare plants and animals, what you find is that Plants have a lot more hydrogen bonding in their uh, cell wall structure, and that extra rigidity means plants don't move uh, as animals do, uh, but also that it gives them the ability to grow uh, and obtain vertical heights of up to several hundred feet in the context of trees, and in general around plants grow anywhere up to a few meters uh, easily with some of the brushes and shrubs in pretty much around the world. This figure just gives some examples of hydrogen bonding uh, in different uh, contexts. Uh, the amide group in proteins engages in hydrogen bonding as we see here. So the on one strand of protein, well it's, it's one long strand, but in one part of it there's a hydrogen that's interacting with an oxygen and another part of it, and that holds those two strands in the same location with a little bit of flexibility for it to move and engage in biological function. And realize that those amide groups exist with every amino acid in the protein chain, and so there's a lot of hydrogen bonding that holds it together with its tertiary structure. When we were talking about cooking at the beginning of class, it is that hydrogen bonds that are broken up with the addition of heat. And that denaturation is A, what kills viruses and bacteria, um, which is why we get a fever when we're sick, but it also, quote, cooks food for us. On the right-hand side is DNA, and the four base pairs in DNA, adenine and thymine, come together with two hydrogen bonds, and guanine and cytosine come together with three hydrogen bonds, and every base pair in DNA has either AT or CG, and you have a lot of hydrogen bonding holding that double helix together. And finally, down in C, something a little bit smaller. If you have something that is carboxylic acid or carboxylic acid-like, as in the uh, nitric acid, 
but the carboxylic acid orientation is amenable to hydrogen bonding with another molecule. So you have the double bond O accepting a hydrogen from another acid, and of course the acid donating as you see here. You end up with a six-membered ring, which is a good structure in the context of energy and simplicity and holding itself together. Now to look at ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is a little bit different in the sense that it's a mixture of intra and intermolecular. The structure that's presented there is sodium chloride. You can't identify NaCl. This is, you can't say this is one NaCl group, this is another NaCl group. They are all the same distance apart. It is a repeating lattice of sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride, extending in three dimensions. So the energy that holds this extended structure together, the energies range from a few hundred kilojoules per mole to a few thousand kilojoules per mole. And the major factor controlling that ionic bond strength is the charge on the ions. At the bottom, there's the equation E is KQ1, Q2 over R. That's a physics equation that tells you what the interaction energy is between two charged particles. We can apply that here. And in sodium chloride, where you have plus one sodium minus one chloride, you're going to get a number. That's the interaction energy. If you, <laughs> excuse me, now have plus two and minus one, you can see that the energy is going to be larger. Plus two minus one has a greater strength than plus one minus one. And plus two minus two, in the context of say magnesium oxide, is going to have a much stronger interaction energy, actually four times, uh, than you would if just NaCl, which is plus one minus one. On the bottom of this is the radius. The radius plays a part. The closer you can get these two charges, the stronger it's gonna be. So things that are bigger ions, like chlorine bromine iodine will have weaker bond energies because they are bigger which means they can't get as close for, even though they're still formally minus one fluorine chlorine bromine iodine so what we have here is we're going to uh, arrange the following in order of increasing melting or boiling point doesn't matter and there's a series of entities present we're going to make an assumption here, and that assumption is that induced dipole interactions are weaker than dipole, which are weaker than ionic interactions. And that will give us an approximate order. We would actually have to go look it up to get a better order. But we should do pretty good just by making that distinction between induced, dipole, and ionic. So. To look at that, we have induced, we have dipole, and we have ionic. What I would like you to do is help me categorize these entities, um, either in the chat or verbalize where something goes. So just say, hey, this entity is Ion induced, dipole, or ionic. Go for it. Ki is ionic. You are correct. K2SO4 is ionic. You're going for the easy ones. Good. Hey, first dibs, you get to pick which one you want. And okay, we got all the ionic ones. Magnesium oxide, I guess I shouldn't have sold you that, but there's three ionic entities. What about the rest? It's okay, you're allowed to guess. Your guesses are probably better than you think they are.
Anyone? CH, it's not CH3, it's the entire molecule at the beginning. Neon is induced dipole, that is correct. H2CO has a dipole, yes it does. Considering it was just on a picture. NO2 has a dipole as well, yes. The CH3, CH2OH, you don't have to type the entire thing in. What is the first one? There's also CO2 and F2 there. Yeah, the first one is got a dipole, CH3, CH2OH. Good. That's propanol. Yeah, uh, that's actually ethanol, not propanol, by the way. We're dealing with... <laughs> CO2 and F2, what are they? CO2 is induced, we've looked at that, good. And F2? F2 is induced, it is. It's the same element, there's no change in electronegativity. There's no bond dipole, so it has to be induced. With regard to the entities that are induced, we're looking at the polarizability. And here, we look at non-bonding electrons probably are, are, are less polarizable than bonding. So neon doesn't have any bonds, so it's probably the lowest. And then between CO2 and F2, uh, well, the other factor is the size, too. Um, fluorine only has two bonding electrons, whereas CO2 has eight, and CO2 is heavier, so very likely that will be the order of melting or boiling point for the induced dipole entities. For dipole, we're looking at the dipole moment. And where we have the dipole and the dipole moment, um, which one has the greatest dipole moment and why? Thanks, Ben. Good answer. Oh, you can tell me which one has the weakest dipole moment. We've looked at both of these. Does any of them have any special types of dipole moment? What do you get when you have oxygen bonded to hydrogen? You have hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is generally strong, so that means if that's a strong form of a dipole moment, that's probably the highest in terms of boiling point. And in the context of the other two, NO2 is two fairly electronegative elements. So the difference in dipole moment between nitrogen and oxygen is pretty small. It is much larger for H2CO. So it's very likely H2CO, which have a larger dipole moment, just based on the difference in electronegativities, is probably going to be higher melting point, boiling point than NO2. And when we look at ionic entities, we're looking at charge. Which of these would have the greatest charges or the lowest charges? Okay. 
lowest is ki exactly so we have plus one and minus one for ki that would be one magnesium oxide has plus two and minus two what about k2so4 K2SO4 has minus 2 and plus 1. So if we want to look at these, if we just look at the energy is proportional to Q1, Q2, we have an energy of 1 times 1 equals 1 for the first one. We have 1 times 1. 2 times 1 equals 2 for the second one. And we have 2 times 2 equals 4 for the third one. So given that the K2SO4 is likely the middle and magnesium oxide is likely the highest boiling point. So now that we've done this separation and division and ca categorization within each group, we can just read off the increasing melting point or boiling point. So we would go with neon, fluorine, carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, H2CO is formaldehyde, and then ethanol, potassium iodide, potassium sulfate, magnesium oxide would be the order. Good. Thank you for your assistance. There's more of that coming up in just a few seconds. So now we want to look at multi-component interactions. What happens when we mix two things together? So, <laughs> so when you mix things together, each of them is going to come in with their own interaction. Uh, could be induced dipole, could be dipole, could be hyd uh, hydrogen bonding, it could be ionic interactions. The energy between the entities will be somewhere between that of the individual homogeneous interactions. If you've got something that's ionic mixed with something that's hydrogen bonding, which is like salt water, it will the, the ion-dipole interaction will be somewhere between ion-ion and hydrogen bonding in water. So I actually gave you the second one but we can go through all of these. So we want to determine the interaction between ethanol and water. I'll talk about sodium chloride and water after we do ethanol and water. What is the dominant intermolecular bond energy in ethanol? And in, we know for water, it's hydrogen bonding. What is it for ethanol? It's also hydrogen bonding, yes. So ethanol hydrogen bonds with itself, water hydrogen bonds with itself. It shouldn't make a difference. There's the negligible. There is negligible difference in energy when you have ethanol hydrogen bonding with water, or water hydrogen bonding with ethanol. And what we see in ethanol water mixtures is that they are completely miscible. We can have one percent ethanol. We can have ninety-nine percent ethanol uh, in water. <coughs> excuse me, and we have that entire range. It's completely miscible. I talked about sodium chloride in water, and I just wanted to draw or illustrate what this is about. We have sodium chloride having an ionic interaction, and we have water with hydrogen bonding or dipole. The reason why sodium chloride dissolves in water is because of the number of interactions. So here we've got H2O interacting with sodium, and it is the oxygen that is attracted to 
the positive sodium ion. And we know from our discussion earlier uh, about this that the sodium ions or all ions are hydrated. And so what I've just drawn on here is the hydration around sodium. Uh, sodium. Similarly for uh, chlorine, it is the hydrogen that It is the hydrogen that interacts there. So they, these dashed lines, those are all ion dipole interactions. And the reason why we can actually dissolve sodium chloride in water is while they are weaker than the ionic interactions, it's because we form so many of them for every ion we put into solution. We form four, six, seven, uh, ion dipole interactions and that balances out the ionic energy at least it does for sodium chloride so sodium chloride is soluble potassium sulfate is soluble but once you get higher than that in terms of charges magnesium oxide is insoluble the charges of plus two and minus two are just too strong to overcome, you can't form enough ion dipole bonds in order to dissolve magnesium oxide in water. Similarly with other highly charged entities. Rust, Fe2O3, okay, doesn't dissolve in water because of that. Al2O3, etc. How about sucrose? What is the major intermolecular interaction in sucrose? Remember the structure of sugar. It's hydrogen bonding as well, it is, yes. Uh, sugars have a whole bunch of uh, alcohol groups, OH groups around, so it hydrogen bonds. And so sugar in water is like ethanol in water, and you know that you can dissolve huge amounts of sugar in water. if you. Uh, Go to Tim Hortons, just listen to the person in front of you, order a quadruple, quadruple. And that's a lot of sugar put into a, a, a poor coffee cup. How about oxygen in water? What do we have for oxygen in water? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry, what's called a four by four? Oh, oh, the... Quadruple, quadruple. Yeah. Whatever. It's an example. I've heard it called triple, triple, quadruple, quad, quad is what I've heard. Quad, quad. Oh. Uh, double, double, double. Oh, okay. Well, at least we're using the chat for something constructive. Oxygen and water. What is the intermolecular interaction in oxygen? We know water is hydrogen bonding. <laughs> ah, so you have to tell us which one you work at, uh, and then we'll all come by and bug you. Oxygen, oxygen, focus, oxygen. I would actually like, yeah, Van der Waals? Yeah, okay, more London forces in Deuce Dipole. Oxygen doesn't have any intermolecular, uh, any any di different atoms, so it can only have induced dipole interactions. Does oxygen dissolve in water? Yes or no? Does oxygen dissolve in water like salt dissolves in water or sugar dissolves in water? And we got to know. It, you're correct. It does not dissolve appreciably in water. We're going to see that on the next slide uh, with the example we've got, but oxygen does not dissolve to an appreciable amount in water. A tiny amount dissolve, like 10 to the minus 3 moles per liter, tiny amounts because it, fish live there and, 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 and the like, but it's not like you're going to get moles per liter of oxygen dissolved in water. 
The reason for that is it's not energetically better. You don't see a benefit creating a bond like this. Oh, yeah, O2. Interacting with that doesn't form a hydrogen bond. There is no hydrogen, uh, that, that bond is weaker than it would be if it was attached to a water molecule here where you actually get some degree of hydrogen bonding. So the interaction with oxygen is weaker. You have an induced coupled with a dipole interaction is weaker. And finally, carbon dioxide in water. Does carbon dioxide dissolve in water? Well, actually, I'm going to change the question. Carbon dioxide is also induced dipole. We've seen that a lot. Why does carbon dioxide dissolve in water better than oxygen? There's a trick answer to this. Why does carbon dioxide dissolve in water better then oxygen dissolves in water. Anyone? What does carbon dioxide also do in water? It reacts, it carbonates. So carbon dioxide would dissolve to the, about the same extent as oxygen, except it happens to react with water to form carbonic acid. So you can't make uh, a, a direct comparison between the two because carbon dioxide has other ways of interacting with water. Um, with what's in your notes to here, I actually changed the question. So I'm asking here, why is oxygen more soluble in fresh water? Why is oxygen more soluble in fresh water than in salt water? Anyone have any suggestions? Even though oxygen's sparingly soluble, like this is micromoles per liter, 400 micromoles per liter, so it dissolves to a very small extent. <coughs> excuse me. But why is it? Why does the solubility go down as you increase the salt concentration? Anyone? Because uh, it's not saturated with salt, but you're on the right track. Because we can always put more salt in up to probably around a few hundred grams per liter. So when we look at this, we have this interaction right here. We're forming strong, and I'm just going to pick a different color. We're forming strong ion dipole bonds, which means the water is going to be less interested in reacting with oxygen. So this weaker bond is less preferred. because water is already engaged in forming stronger ion dipole bonds and so oxygen solubility decreases with increasing salinity. And using our uh, similar arguments, why does oxygen solubility decrease with increasing temperature? We see that at zero degrees Celsius solubility is highest and by the time we get to 50 degrees Celsius, it is literally one third of what it was previously at zero. Why is that the case? Why does oxygen solubility decrease with increasing temperature? What does increasing the temperature do?
before it vaporizes the water, you're on the right track. When you increase the temperature, what do you add? What do you have to add in order to increase the temperature? Energy. Right, so you're adding energy. What does energy do to chemical bonds? It breaks them. Right, excellent. Going back over to the document camera, uh, sorry, data uh, tablet. Get rid of some of the stuff I don't need. Okay, so now we have this here. Good. Which bonds are going to break faster? The stronger ion dipole bonds or the weaker bonds here? Which bonds will break faster? The strong ion dipole bonds or the weaker induced ones? The weaker ones, right. So the reason why we get rid of oxygen, why oxygen doesn't dissolve to, any, uh, to a lesser and lesser extent, is because these bonds are weak and they break faster. What do we know, maybe know, what do we maybe know about salt water in terms of vaporization? Anyone? What do we know about salt water in terms of vaporization and boiling point? It has a higher boiling point, and the reason it has a higher boiling point is explainable with this. We're forming stronger bonds here, and those stronger bonds take more energy to break. So the water boils at a higher temperature because you have to break those stronger ion dipole bonds. Good. Are there any other questions on this? So the question is, so adding salt to the boiling of spaghetti water makes it boil slower. Uh, the amount of salt that you add is, does an inappreciable amount. It doesn't change the boiling point maybe by a tenth or a hundredth of a degree. It doesn't affect it at all. Adding salt, yes, Gordon Ramsay lied. He also swears a lot, just in case you didn't notice. Um, what adding salt to boiling water does, actually, uh, it actually adds flavor to the spaghetti. So, And if you're looking at boiling eggs, you add salt to that as well to, to make hard boiled egg or any boiled eggs. That just prevents the shell from dissolving uh, as much. So you have a, you, you don't want the shell to dissolve because of the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, low uh, ionic strength of the water. Good. Other questions? So now to look at liquids. Within liquids, there are two types of interactions that control the properties of the liquid. There are cohesive interactions that bind the liquid molecules together. So within the liquid, you have uniform interactions between all of the molecules. It's just one homogeneous co range of cohesive interactions. At the surface, the adhesive interactions between the liquid and the surroundings, the surroundings could be air or it could be the surface container, um, will depend. Sometimes the interactions are weak with, with the interaction with the surroundings are weaker, such as in this case with air, you end up having stronger uh, intermolecular interactions that hold the liquid together. And that leads us to the idea of surface tension that holds the droplet together with, uh, and minimizes contact with the surroundings. On the other side of it, this interactions could be stronger. And on the stronger side of interactions, we see the, in this case, if this is water in glass, we see uh, wetting of the surface and uh, a positive meniscus formed there. So the cohesive interactions bind the liquid together. The adhesive interactions with the surroundings could be stronger or weaker than that of the cohesive interactions. I mentioned surface tension in the previously. Surface tension um, is the cohesive interactions of the liquid 
forming a barrier between the liquid and its surroundings. Now, if we think about a water droplet in air, to minimize the area uh, the, between the li liquid and the surroundings, we end up forming a drop. A sphere has a minimum of surface area and the surface tension draws it into a droplet form. That also occurs on different surfaces. If the surface is something that it doesn't interact with well, i.e. it's low uh, adhesive interactions, you see it wanting to avoid contact with the surface and you see water beading on the surface and you get a large contact angle as presented there. If, however, the surface is similar, i.e. it's polar, um, then the water will actually wet to the surface because the, interact, the, the adhesive interactions and the cohesive interactions are about the same, so it doesn't matter whether it interacts with the surface or it interacts with itself, and you see a wetting to the surface. Here are some examples uh, of surface tension in play. The top left is an insect that is common, at least in BC and Alberta, it's called a water strider. And it's able to run across the surface of the water because it has, the surface tension prevents the legs from actually dipping into the water and it uh, is able to move across the, the surface. On the right hand, top right hand side you have a plant that ex is, has excreted some sort of waxy or oily uh, protective layer and that means the water droplets aren't binding or wetting to the, 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 the leaf surface. The bottom two are water interacting with wood. On the right hand side you see water that has completely wetted to the wood. Wood is polar, it's hydrogen bonds, all that stuff. Sort of, so you're going to see that wetting occurring. That's natural. That's what one would expect if you had just raw wood and it was being rained on. On the left hand side it's actually treated wood. Treated with something that is hydrophobic, provides a protective layer. That water, if it gets into the wood, facilitates biological degradation, facilitates decay of the wood. So you want to prevent that by putting on a coating. So in this example, uh, we're looking at a nonpolar liquid such as gasoline. What will it do on a polar surface? And I've actually answered that from the picture, but what will gasoline do on a nonpolar surface? And we'll talk about both in just a few seconds. Will gasoline wet to a nonpolar surface or will it bead on a nonpolar surface? Go for it. Wet or bead? Benjamin says wet. Why do you say wet? Okay, never mind. We're getting the answer uh, through other people. Good. It's nonpolar, nonpolar. Gasoline doesn't have really strong cohesive bonds in itself, they're nonpolar, barely holding it together. It wets, as we see in the picture here, it wets to water because the hydrogen bonding or the dipole in water is positive interaction with the uh, induced dipole that's in the gasoline. So it's a stronger interaction with water than it is in the gasoline. So you see it wetting to the water surface as presented here. A nonpolar surface will have the same strength as the nonpolar surfaces in gasoline. So it'll actually wet to uh, a nonpolar surface as well. The interactions between the liquid and the surroundings determine um, how it interacts. And I, we saw in the picture previously that there was stronger co uh, adhesive interactions with the surroundings, and that's what we see here. The interactions with the wall of this, well, it's a capillary, it's a tube, are stronger than they are <coughs> cohesively, and you see it moving towards the surface. As you make that tube smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, the strength of that, uh, the energy is the same, and it actually is able to draw more and more liquid up that capillary tube. This is the basis for the transportation, or partially the basis for the transportation of fluids in plants, uh, how wax is drawn up by the candle wick, 
and how paper towel soaks up spills. You see, excuse me, you see the fibers of the, wa the string or the fibers of the paper towel uh, absorbing the water or whatever it is, wax, uh, the molten wax, and drawing into the, the fibrous material itself. So capillary action can actually extend for you know, several centimeters uh, and longer in, in, under the right conditions. Uh, in the context of some types of chromatography, not all, but some types of chromatography, which if you continue to t in chemistry and take, take Chem 210, we'll talk about chromatography at length, um, but there is an interaction between the substance and the carrier it's on. So you may have done chromatography where you've taken some colored pens and with these colored pens you've made dots on a piece of filter paper and then ran probably water or uh, a solvent over top of it and it separated the chemicals in the pens into the constituent colors. You could also have done that with um, M&Ms in filter paper, coffee papers, and you see the colors that go into the dye that forms the, the M&M. Not everything has a stronger interaction with the surroundings. Some chemicals and some uh, surfaces have a weaker uh, adhesive interaction. So here's an example of mercury. Mercury has much stronger cohesive interactions, weaker adhesive interactions. And so you actually have a negative meniscus for mercury. And in the one on the right is water. There's a positive meniscus for water because it interacts better with the glass than it does the, itself. If you were to put water into some types of tubing, Teflon tubing, some plastic tubings, you're going to see a negative meniscus there because water doesn't interact with the non, well with the nonpolar surface of the plastic tubings. And given the time, it looks like that's where we can finish off for today. Does anyone have any questions? I appreciate the interaction. It's taken a bit to get people talking in class, so um, I would appreciate you continuing to do it. And I'm, uh, you know, even if someone makes an error in their statement, I'm not going to be negative about it. We'll work towards getting the correct understanding. So, all right, everybody. Uh, yes, on Friday I will be. I've only got another 15 or 20 minutes of this material, so we will be starting chapter 14 as well. So finish off this chapter plus start 14 on Friday. All right, good deal. So have a great uh, day and don't forget you've got stuff to do before next day. So take care. Have a good day.